But let's talk about when you were growing up and what kind of childhood you had. Do you think you had a happy childhood? Even though this happened to you, it was still confusing. Like, you know, you see children, they'll still be like jumping rope and doing hopscotch and you may not know everything going on with them. So do you think you had a happy childhood? Yeah, growing up, you know, I wasn't real happy at all because, for one, my father wasn't there. And I was one of those that always wanted my father. My father was a hero to me, or well, he was supposed to be a hero. And everything that he would tell me, his word was, you know, was gold. So with him not being there, I was always upset. My mother was a single parent for, for, for some part, on part in time. Then she, you know, eventually had other kids. She had six kids. I was the second oldest. Um, I had a stepfather who I wouldn't say he was a bad dude he just didn't really interact is what I would say the most would be make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and bring me some juice you see what I'm saying so you know at the end of the day I still wanted my father and that's just how you know that's just how it was with me my mother she was a parent that was in and out of the hospital different types of surgeries she had you know arthritis really bad you know so we pretty much went through the struggle did she loved you very much and you and your brothers and sisters like did you know your mom loved you my mother loved me but what I feel like just with most parents in the african-american community we have issues they had issues the way they was raised you know when you dealing with um for example my mom's her stepfather, well, my mother's father, actually, I don't know if he was thrown off the roof or he, he jumped off a roof, but um, he pretty much died at a young age. And then her stepfather came along and he molested all, all my mother's sisters. So because of that, my mother left home at a young age. Now, whatever mental issues she had from being raised in a household like that trickled down on the way she raised me. And one of my biggest problems with my mother and parents like her is that sometimes when you chastise your child you put fear in them so when they need to come to you and say well mom this is what happened you don't know how some parents when you do something wrong or something happens what happens with them is oh it's your fault so then you feel like hey mom if I come and tell you that XYZ did this you're gonna turn around and beat me and say this is my fault so that was one of the one of the problems that I had with my mother in coming forward to, in telling her. The second problem is you dealing with a Zulu nation, a Bambada, somebody that's strong. And no matter how, you know, parents will sit up there and say, I do this, I do that for my child. I knew my mother didn't have no wins with that. So pretty much um I just didn't feel comfortable telling my mother. The, the comfortability of saying mom this is what's going on it, it wasn't there and after you get a certain point or a certain age the conflict that comes between a mother and son now don't get me wrong I love my mother to death and I know my mother loved me but there was issues there there's not a book that comes and this is what I will say on behalf of my mother there's not a book that comes that tells you or teaches you how to raise a child especially a young man my father he has to hold up to accountability for not balancing that scale out and being there to help her. You see what I'm saying? You're dealing with six kids, you cripple, in and out of the hospital. Then you're dealing with the, men the, the mentality of the household, how you was raised. She didn't have all the answers. Now, dealing with my mother, she'll sit up there and tell me, dealing with my children, oh, you better not do this, you better not do that. And I'll be like, yo. You should have tried that with me, but you know, this is where she at now. I have to learn from my mistakes because when I get older, or my children get older rather, they're going to sit back and they're going to tell me, well, dad, this is what you did wrong. Well, I went to own 102, uh, who was the principal, Mr. Locasio, for most of the people in Bronx River. To tell you the truth, I never really liked school. I always used to act out because I always had issues, that my father issues, and all my main issues was... I wanted my dad there and no matter what he did or he didn't do my mother was always the bad guy so I had a lot of resentment towards my mother because of my father not being there now that I'm older it's like okay 
<laughs> but I can't hold a grudge now because we, we you know we have a relationship here grown man but as far as school go I never really liked school I couldn't really pay attention I was always upset I always had issues me personally I think as a kid I needed counseling the stress was there I guess now I can understand it a little bit more but then you know Um, where's your dad now, do you know? Oh, he's around. He is. He's, he's in my life, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's... Okay, he, uh-huh. That's he, good. He cleaned, he cleaned this act up. Me and my... You know, my dad is like... Uh, uh, he used to always say to me as a kid, who's your best friend? I'd be like, you. Even though he was um, negligent, he was still dad. My mother used to have to make him put his hands on me, and he wouldn't. You know, so she pretty much had to do the majority of everything. He didn't do nothing. So it sounds like that your dad did love you, so why wasn't he around? What do you think is the reason? Drugs. Oh, answer, say. You know, me talking to my father now, he said my mom's, you know, she never knew it, but he was addicted to heroin, heroin since he was 13 years old. So his brain was fried. How do you mature when you're dealing with dope? And, you know, now he's cleaned up his act. He's being a father. I have a little brother from him on, I believe my little brother's probably about 12, and maybe 12, 13, somewhere around there, and he's being a good dad. So I'm happy for that. He may not be the best grandfather, but he tries. So, you know, as far as school goes, school was, eh, never really cared for it. I could school couldn't catch my attention. I had too much on my mind, my mind at all times. Maybe, I mean, I guess because of some of the stuff that was going on, uh, I don't know. A lot of things I blanked out, so it's, it's like, whatever. Wait, were your brothers and sisters uh, kind of independent, too? Was, did you all just kind of, like, go off your own ways as kids? Because different age, like, my brother had his friends, my sister had hers, and I had mine. Well, growing up, my older sister was a year older than me, so... The majority of the time, the rest of the, it was six of us. Most of the time, I would be the babysitter. If my mom was out working or if she was doing whatever she was doing, I was the one at home babysitting. And my older sister would be like, get the kids the hell away from me. <laughs> like, she, she didn't want to be bothered. And I pretty much held the majority of the responsibility in the house when my mother wasn't there. Even when she, you know, she had her baby father before she broke up with him. When he was working and my mom's was out, I pretty much held the house out. I was I was the babysitter. So um, so how how did your family this that part of your family handle all of this coming your coming forward? Uh, did they know anything about it? How how are they now with you with this whole thing? Well, my family um they didn't really know nothing about none of this stuff. I'm pretty sure it blew everybody's mind, but. Personally, everybody's missing in action. That's how I personally feel. But the way I see things now is like some people look at me as a strong figure. And sometimes people feel like when you're a strong figure that you don't need nobody to be strong for you too. So this situation right here, I pretty much dealt with by myself. There was no people in your corner like, oh, I got you. It was just me. And... Even, you know, besides my team that, you know, that hold me down behind the scenes or whatever the case may be, you know, some of the people that I grew up with from Bronx Trevor that was down with Zulu Nation, it's like, it's like basically having somebody say, hey, your mom's a pedophile. Ben was a father figure to all of us. So for some of them, they still dealing with the shame and embarrassment. Their whole livelihood was based off the Zulu Nation and the reputation. So now when you expose the ugly side of the monster in the closet to the world, it's a reflection on all of us. It's like a badge of, uh, of, of shame for all of us, even myself. Dealing with Bambada, you know, the, 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 the different chapters, the people that wasn't even in Zulu, but just was like Zulu because they was part of Bronx River. It was like the, the, the original family. You had the... Zulu in the center or the Zulu in the meeting we the Zulu members of this chapter and that chapter and then you just had 
We are the very Zulus. We was raised in this. We grew up in Bronx River. This is us. This is who we are. Everybody had to wear this shame. Bronx River's reputation is forever tarnished behind what Bam did. The legacy of the Zulu Nation, the, the, the parties, the fighting, the meetings, the getting the plaques and awards for doing good in the community, it all goes out the window. What does it mean um, for the Zulu Nation being hip hop's first family? Well, growing up in um, as being a part of the Zulu Nation, see me, I went from being just, I'm from Bronx River in a Bronx River Zulu to becoming a part of Shaka Zulu, up under B.O., Bobby, Jerry, you know, my older brothers, Big F, and it was like an honor because these were the dudes that I looked up to, B.O., Bobby, Jerry, F., you know, Rod, these, like, these were like the, the, the big guys, the, the warriors, so it, it, it felt good. You wanted to be a part of them. Then when you look at the, the artists, the celebrities, you know, it, Zulu just had everything, every element to it. This is the first family of hip hop. And it could have been the best feeling of the world. It, Zulu could have been the best thing that ever happened if Bam would have kept his sick ways out of it. If Bam would have just been the person, because anybody that you speak to about Bam, they're going to tell you Bam is a good guy. People, people will die for Bam. I would have died for Bam. If Bam somehow, in some way, could have changed his ways and said, you know what, I'm not going to be this monster no more. I'm going to turn away and I'm just going to try to heal and give back. He would be a great person. But then again, to the, the flip side to that, I would have to ask myself, was this part of his manipulation to be able to do what he did? So I don't know. And when you're dealing with the Zulu Nation, a, a family like that, it's kind of hard to come forward and say, hey, the father, the godfather, or tell somebody, hey, my mom, my grandpa's, this is a pedophile. This type of stuff goes on in our community all the time. It's never exposed. Dealing with this topic, there's been plenty of conversations where people let the cat out the bag to me like, hey, uncle such and such, this is the one that touched this cousin. And then these discussions happen at the dinner table or through phone conversations. And now all of these cousins is finding out, hey, I'm not the only one he got. So now you find out that the, the uncle in the family then actually got about 15 family members. This is the case with Bambada. All of the elements of hip hop, all of the elements of the first family of hip hop. And now I see, and from what I understand, you know, Bam's cult, because that's what I'm going to call it, a sick satanic cult. His sick satanic cult, he was shaped and molded by Dr. York. Dr. York had his family. Dr. York was one of the illest teachers and manipulators that you'll ever find he was able he started off in christianity switched over to judaism switched over to islam switched over to some other groups and then formed the nuwabians he took people from every group and then raised enough money and he came from the industry he was a singer so he dealt he dealt with a lot in the industry i heard bam um if it's true i'm not sure if it's true he um he recorded Planet Rock with Dr. York. He recorded uh, Planet Rock Revisited or with the, the remix with the Jungle Brothers at York Studios. Yeah, so it shows that Dr. York was an influence behind the scenes on Bam's movement. And I don't know who taught Bam how to move and how to do what he did, but he had all the elements to be the sick psychotic pedophile that he was. It's like whatever they put on the fly trap or the mouse trap to attract the mouse to trap them this is what he did to trap the children um just for my own information maybe it'll go in maybe it won't but have you looked have you looked at other cult leaders like besides dr york you know what stands out to me that a lot of people don't see i tell people all the time you ever met somebody that you say i seen this person before. I don't like him. Now, you don't even know him, but you recognize their energy, their pattern. 
behind the scenes when Bam is not outside doing lectures and DJing and whatever, the, the, the speeches, the movement, when he's dealing with the youth, he turns into a little child. Him and Michael, J Michael Jackson have so many similarities that it's crazy. You would think that he had split personalities because he would turn into the, the Malcolm X, the Farrakhan, and then he would turn into a 10-year-old um, kid. This is what attracted all the teenagers. He got identified with you. Whatever you was into, he would be into. He just had all of the elements around to attract everybody. And this is why the youth was attracted to him. I mean, even when he started the hip-hop movement, they were young. Even though he was a little bit older than some, but they were young. So he knew. It's like, I would say... He was a grown man that knew how to stay stuck in kid mode, and then he knew how to come back up to his grown his grown man. And I guess being a pedophile, it worked for him. Where he was able to manipulate and get in good with the children and find ways to keep them around. He had his own Neverland, which was the hip-hop movement. Let's talk about, can you tell us about, I should say, let's tell me about building 1609 and um, as a child, whatever you remember, and the floors today, when you look up the nonprofit status of the Zoo, Universal Zulu Nation in New York State, it's building, the contact person is Africa Bambata, 1609 whatever the rest of that Bronx, New York, um, eighth floor. Some, it's an apartment on the eighth. Seven. I think it was the seventh. Now it's eighth floor. But I'll double check. So Was it the eighth floor? I, you know what? It's been so I, many years. We, but I just looked it up. I could have the, the floors wrong, but it's still that 1609. So tell, tell us about six, the building 1609, because I'm going to show footage of 1609. Too, okay. Whenever you're ready. Well, on um, 1609, which was one of Bam's buildings, he was in seven, um, seven five, then he was in, um, no, nine five, then 1609. But 1609 was like pretty much the office, the headquarters, where, you know, business was conducted and also the apartment where he, that was one of his pedophile rings, where he did the um, child molestation. And in 1609, you know, pretty much you would go up there and... <laughs> That's where the sickness begins, with the um, the porno, the 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 the, the Vaseline, you name it. So you're a child though. So like what I'm hearing, uh, what in my head is Ahmed talking to Star. I had an office set up, man. Da -da -da -da. Now, but he's of another. He's like Bam's age. So you, as a little kid going over there, would see it totally different than what he's talking about. So describe what would go, go be over there. And this is going back to us in the studio, just in case, because um, we use just this footage. But you said there was a weight room. I don't know if you know about the office in the kitchen, if that was even in your purview or not. You know, who would be over there, mix it in one room, you know, like, just what describe what what's going on. Well, in 1609, you might see a little bit of everybody in there. You know, you had everybody was there. You have celebrities coming up in there. The kitchen was the office. You know, the whole house was pretty much a hangout. Our med room was the room to the back. Bam room was to the back, but to the um to the left. So their room was just like this. And um, the room next to the bed. When you come closer up, the first room was the weight room and the bathroom. But the um kitchen was the office and in, in the living room. And pretty much when you go you go up there, you see everybody. Everybody was in Bam's house. It was the hangout spot. If it wasn't inside the center or in the middle of the circle, it was up, it was up in Bam's house. You would go to Bam's house and have a good time. You just better learn the ropes of when to get the hell up out of there. Is that what happened? That some, some people knew when to get the hell out? Because I'm interested in Half Pint's story, too. Would this have been the place where Half Pint would have gone to the bathroom and Bam came in there also? Well, I think in, in Half in Half Pint's own the, the situation with him, this is when Bam was in the building that's right across in, 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 in the other building and where, where that own pretty much happened. But from what I understand, well, I, what I know, 
Bronx River wasn't the only place. There was another place that I never, I never mentioned about, which was over by Baychester, Mark Terrace, where Van Mother used to live at. Van was molesting people over there too. Do we know anything about his mom? Um, I heard that he had an older brother that got killed. Do you know anything about that? And if you don't, it's fine. No, I don't. I don't really know too much about um, his older brother. But I do know about his mother. I know very little, little about his mother. I've been to the apartment. I've seen her. It's been a long time since I've seen her. You know, last time I, I checked, she was working. I think she was working in a hospital, in a clinic, or whatever the case may be. But um, I don't really know too much about his mother. I've been around her, but I, you know, I see you. She go in her room, and that's it. And that's, you know, up out of Mark Terrace. But in Mark Terrace, he was molesting kids over there, too. So that was another building where he was back and forth between Bronx River and Mark Terrace molesting. Uh, let's go back to the 1609 apartment. Now, um, describe, if you don't mind, is, describe the scene again when you would go, when you would be there with two of your other friends. You don't have to name friends. Yeah, I remember um, being in 1609 in the weight room, me and some of my boys, and we was lifting weights. Bam come in the room with the lemonades and the um, chips and stuff like that. And what stood out to us was the um, episode. I just watched this episode, too, again. With um, Dougley and Arnold from Different Strokes. And they was in the bike shop. And the guy in the bike shop was pretty much, he was he was doing the Bam Bada thing. Rolled out first. He leaves the, um, the magazine laying around with the naked woman. The next thing you know, it's the it's the porno. So now we in the um the weight room and Bam is like pretty much he pulls out the Polaroid. And you're how old now? I don't remember how old I was. So he pulls out the Polaroid and he starts taking pictures like, Oh, y'all got some big muscles. You should take off your shirt. And we all hyped up trying to figure out which one of us got the biggest muscles. And after a while, you could just see the lust in his face. And we brought up the situation that the, the Arnold and Dudley to each other with the different strokes and got creeped out. And, you know, we decided to uh, get dressed and slide up out of there and leave. You know, so that, that day right there, we pretty much ducked him. But uh, other days, you know, he pretty much caught a lot of us. There was a time where... Um, what, which wasn't the time. The, the the things that the things that Bam did, I can go so many di directions with this. Like for example, his book, the Black Book. You open up the Black Book, and every dude that you ever looked up to that was a strong figure in Bronx River was in that book with their pants down. How how big is this book? I'm gonna have a I'm gonna show a drawing of the book, like a recreation of the book. So is it like a photo album book, or is it like a this kind of size book, or like what size? It's do a you think it's is? a thick book, but he has a, he has a few of them. It's not just one book. He oh, has it's a, not just one. Yeah, book. he has a, he has a few books, okay. and, and it's pretty much. And you much, just turn the page, yeah, like it's, all it's, old time yeah, photo it's, albums. It's, it's pretty much a, a, a book with a lot of photos. That's like what, photo. what people what people don't understand what. I look at people and I be having conversations with them, not even saying to them, I seen you in that book. And this is why you hear like so, so many people in Bronx River have a problem with me that they never going to say behind the scenes, they're going to talk, I seen you. They know they're in the book. They remember the flashes, the cameras, cha -ching, he got it, he got cha -ching, he got the money shot. So with, with Bam being in 1609, you might go up in there, you know, and it, it, there was there was times where when you look at the book when Bam first broke me in it was the book it was the I remember him sitting up there telling me that you're supposed to you're supposed to masturbate it's okay you're supposed to watch porn and I'm really thinking to myself like here we go again because this wasn't the first time I was molested but it's like it's it's creepy then you have Bam in there making you like he there's been times he made me actually watch him give oral sex to dudes that's still around in Zulu right now. They know who they are. I would have to actually stand there and, and watch this shit. And there was quite a few of them. It wasn't just one of them. It was quite a few of them. 
But even still, when you sit back and you analyze them, now they were 10 years, some of them was 10 years older than me, which Bam was still older than them. So you would deal with, you, you would deal with him with the oral sex. One of the things that um that stood out the most to me, or that that stuck that stuck, it was like one time it was me and another brother, I don't want to mention his name. You know, he just came on. He actually just came on for murder, like maybe about some a few years back or whatever the case. Bam had all three of us in his room with porno on, with a jaw of Vaseline, with our pants down, stroking all three of us, basically trying to make us masturbate in the room with him. Because you know that that's his thing. You're supposed to masturbate. This is what boys are supposed to do. And in his house, every time you came in Bam's house and you gave somebody some dap, it's always Vaseline on their hand. It's just disgusting it's gross so this is what 1609 was it was the um i don't know what to call that the, uh, 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 a, cess a cesspool for pedophiles for pedophilia that's what that house was and you know i can sit up there and say you know at the end of the day ahmed has never participated in none of that i've never seen ahmed have any interactions with bam like that but I still have to say, there's no way in hell that I met didn't know what was going on in his goddamn house. Any at any given time, you would come in that house, and you would see about like there's been times I walked in Bam house. Well, I had the keys to the house. I would walk in the house because I I, li I lived there. I would walk in the house, and you would see dudes from the UK, white boys, like about seven of them, all of them with their shirts off, watching porno, jerking off. And this is what Bam did. This is what the environment that he kept. And, you know, if you were from Bronx River, it was no secret to you. If you was from Bronxdale, if you was from Soundview, if you was from, like, any of the areas in the Bronx, it was no secret to you. You knew what was going on with Bam. It was, like, to us, it wasn't surprising. Honestly speaking, even to the hip-hop movement, where they act like they were so surprised, they wasn't surprised. The story's been going on with this man forever. The same way the story's been going on with Dr. York forever.